Zinni's Painting in the Age of the Renaissance, Bloomington, Indiana University Press. Chapter 3, The Visionaries and Their Followers by Bruce Cole. Two artists, Sassetta and Giovanni di Paola, were to originate, develop, and carry into the unfolding of uh, Quattrocento styles of remarkable power and vision. Their art contains a particularly Sienese mixture of innovation and deep respect for their for and utilization of the past. They transported their painting to a pre-eternal, pre-natural realm where spectral saints wander through golden mountains whose peaks touch radiant skies. Two men ex exerted a limited but powerful sway on a number of other noteworthy painters, but the latter's talent and powers of innovation, while considerable, were not equal to their teachers. Sassetta altarpiece painted between 1423 and 1426 for the wool guild of Siena, the Arte de Lana, had a tremendous impact on Sienese painting for the rest of the century. It was placed in the guild's chapel and dedicated to the guild's feast day. Corpus Domini, like Duccio Maesta, of the, a century before, Sassetta's altarpiece expanded the possibilities of the city's style and served as a milepost in its art. Only the bare facts are known of Sassetta's life. His real name was Stefano di Giovanni. His father seems to have moved from Cortana to Siena, and the artist himself was probably born in Siena around 1390. How he how he came to be called Salsetta is unclear, but the suggestion that the name might refer to the place of his birth, a town called Salsetta in the Mar Marima, an area southwest of Siena, is certainly wrong. Moreover, the subcreate may not have appeared until the 18th century. Nevertheless, from the Arte della Lana altarpiece until about the middle century, middle of the century, several large and important works allow us to trace the outlines of Sassetta's career. Originally, the Arte della Lana altarpiece consisted of a center exaltation of the host, Corpus Domini, picturing the host worshipped by flying angels in a landscape. This painting was flanked by four panels of saints. Above the major panels were the coronation of the Virgin of, and the angel and the Virgin of the Annunciation. The predella below was in three parts, with scenes from the lives of S.S. Thomas Aquinas and Anthony and the miracles of the sacrament on either side of the Last Supper. By the early 19th century, the chapel had been demolished, and Salsetta's large altarpiece had been dismantled, dispersed, and in great part lost. The remaining fragments testify to Salsetta's youthful brilliance. Some of the most ev evocative parts of the Pradella panels now in S S the Siena Pin Pinacoteca, the institution of the Eucharist, figures 26, was the central one and was originally directly up below the exaltion of ho the host. In the institution of the Eucharist, Christ is the pri private figure, for he alone faces the worshiper as he holds the landscape. Salsetta's landscape, however, is not simple repetition of what he saw. Rather, it is infused with supernatural power manifested by, by the light, by the land, and by the strange balictic scene of demonic violence. In the center of this enchanted world, St. Anthony rise and during the torment of the hideous de devils, Pulled, beaten, and lashed, the pathetic, wide-eyed saint stares out helplessly. About six years after completing the Art della Lana altarpiece, Salsetta began the next of his major ex extant works, the Madonna of the Snows, figure 28, 
dedicated to St. Mary of the Snows, Santa Maria de, 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 del Nevi. The predia of this altarpiece tells the story of the miraculous summer snowfall that declined, I'm sorry, that de delineated the foundation of the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. The Sienese had a special ver veneration for this event, and several altarpieces dedicated to Mary as the Virgin of the Snows were made for Sienese churches. Sassetta's altarpiece was intended for the altar of St. Mary of the Snows in the Siena Duomo and was therefore a commission of extraordinary prestige. The painting has large areas of gold and lapis and was probably one of the most expensive altarpieces painted in Siena during the entire 15th century. Although it has come down to us in a battered and abraded condition, with much paint missing, the altarpiece is still magnificent. Both Commissioner and its artist were aware that it would be in close proximity to Docio's Maestà, Simone Martini's Annunciation, and other several altarpieces by renowned, renowned artists of Siena's glorious past. Sassetta proved himself worthy of the challenge. His altarpiece not only <clears throat> continues the tradition established by Duccio, but does so in a very innovative manner. It contains many new ideas about the composition and space. The symmetry and balance are unprecedented in Sienese painting, except for the works of the Lorenzetti's. The large Madonna is, a, is the center of a balanced group of saints and angels all set into space in a coherent, rational way. The harmony of the work, its architect, architectonic quality, and the skillful foreshortening of the figures, note especially the angels holding the crown above the Madonna's head, reveal the influence but not the domination of the Masaccio. Throughout the altarpiece, Sassetta makes the language of Masaccio and his first followers, among whom must be included his own. Let me go ahead and... There's the piece. Sassetta has put in... Put the monumental serious innovations of Masaccio, which inspired the angels and the massive child into a pictorial context unlike anything by a Florentine painter. In a realm where grace and fantasy rule, <coughs> excuse me, the colors pinks, yellows, reds, and blues are vivacious, and there is a wealth of pattern and an abundance of gold. Even the figures such as S.S. John and Francis are skillfully and volumetrically constructed and appear to float in this richly patterned world. The seriousness of Masaccio has been replaced by a lighter, more delicate spirit, evident in many of the details. For example, the dainty angel leaning, kneading a snowball at the right of the, of the throne. Everywhere Sassetta's heritage reasserts itself. The wistful Madonna and the melancholy saints recall Simone's figures of a century before. Patterns of, a, of design and color demonstrate knowledge of works such as Bartolo di Freddi's Adoration of the Magi. Finished several decades earlier and the sumptuousness of the ensemble frame, gold color and design accord with the time-honored traditions of Sienese painting. It is only the in the predella that one sees a major break with the past, possibly because Sassetta felt free, freer to experiment in this less conspicuous part of the altarpiece. The events of the miraculous founding of Santa Maria Maggiore are narrated in several in seven small panels some of them badly damaged, filled with figures 
action and architecture, they form a lively foil to the splendid panel above. But they are also remarkable for the overall composition, for they all seem to be part of a long, continuous narrative, especially the three rightmost paintings, which share a common mountainous horizon, although the idea of a unified predella is, seen, is first seen in the work of Petr Pietro Lorenzetti, to whom Seta's small paintings are heavily indebted, never before had the little panels been so effectively unified. Now, now, now where are the up-to-date inventions of Seta's fertile mind and his love for the Sienese past better meshed in the polyptic, polyptic in the lovely hill town of Cortana? The artist's ancestral city in the center are Madonna, child, and angels, and pictured in side, sandal, side panels are S.S. Nicholas, Michael, John the Baptist, and Margaret. Unfortunately, the painting lost much of its enlivening li surface detail because of improper storage during the Second World War. Traditional types and forms are especially evident in the central panel where the Madonna sits. Her body is nearly frontal, but moves into space on a subtle diagonal axis, extending from her carved back to the most to the foremost folds of her robe in the lower right corner. The axis is intersected by another formed by the foreshortening bodies of the two angels. Thus, the figures move back and forth in space with the direction and rhythm of an X. Such strong movement is not traditionally found in the central panel of the polyptic, and its invention must be credited to Cecilia, who uses traditional motifs and forms to create new composition and contents. The influence of Simone Martini is felt in the swinging beauty of the Virgin's posture in her looped robes and in the delicate comely, comely faces but it is the ethereal grace combined with tensions of melancholy that particularly recalls older artists. Extraordinary refinement of color, line, and form only heightens the sadness of these elegantly shaped but wistful figures. The crown of Sassetta's imagination is the large double-faced altarpiece for the high altar of San Francisco. Francesco, in the small provincial town of San, San Pocro. The work is unusually well documented. It was contracted for in 1437 and set in the place in 1444. Unfortunately, the altar place was dismembered and the pieces are now scattered. On its front, the Blessed Ranieri, John the Baptist, John the Evangelist, and St. Anthony of Padua flanked the enthroned Madonna, Child, and Angels. Figure 30, the back of the polyptic, polyptic was composed of a central image of St. Francis in glory surrounded by scenes from his life and legend. Ancillary panels further decorated the sides and top of the painting. Like the Madonna of the Snows, the sun's Pocro altarpiece was a large, elaborate, and important commission indicative of the fame of Sassetto, had achieved outside of Siena by the late 1430s. Florentine influence is still apparent in the Madonna and Child, especially in the wonderfully foreshortened face faces of the music-making angels, but there is less concern with rational construction of either figure or space. Pattern line color and detail are as important of the, as the spatial arrangement of the figures. The same tendency is seen in the flanking saints whose willowy weightless bodies make swaying patterns against the gold ground. The overall minuteness and fi fineness of this work, its taunt line and its comely from all Signal Sassetta's concern for the glories of Duccio Simone Martini and his vital Sienese heritage. Sassetto has not forgotten the lessons of Florence, but they 
are now seem less important as his attention turns more to rendering celestial figures <coughs> in an aura of sanctity and grace. <coughs> Excuse me. Sassetta, like many Sienese artists, increasingly moved from the measurable to the unfathomable and supernatural. Nowhere is the aspect this aspect clearer than in the surpassing St. Francis in ecstasy, in which the transported saint hovers in a mist in a mist of reddish gold seraphim, blessed by three virtues and standing on three vices. He is suspended over a rippling green sea stretching back to a dark horizon of hills and inlets. This blaze of transcendental color and form is a glorious vision of religious ecstasy. Bellini's St. Francis and Bernini's vision of St. Teresa are two of the rare images that inhabit the same world of inspired imagination. So radiant is the, is the central panel that the onlooker feels part of some ethereal shimmering realm as an aid to devotion and med meditation. Part of its original function, the incandescence of St. Francis in ecstasy is nearly unmatched to in the entire history of art. At once iconic and realistic, remote yet near, the saint touches it, us profoundly. This primordial and vibrant talisman is one of the miracles of the sans pulcro altarpiece and of Sasset's art. Several of the small narration narrating the Francescan legend are also masterpieces. The most famous and deservedly so is the mystic marriage of St. Francis with poverty. Sassetta's considerable power of imagination is released in this vision. He has searched for and found wonderful equivalents for the tender, mystic nature of this of his subject, the sharply foreshortened deserted landscape and the looming range of dark gray mountains with an occasional distant peak still catching the sun. Dotted with tiny cities still create the expectant setting for the miraculous action occurring in the foreground. The three apparitions, each acting not only as the personification of a virtue, but also as an abstract field of col color filling the center foreground, are as comely, ethereal, and reticent as their vir virtuous natures. In an unforgettable gesture of timidity and humbleness, Francis reaches for hard to slip the ring on the hand of poverty. Above the virtues ascend toward heaven, but not poverty looks back to gaze tenderly on her new bridegroom once more. This touching and important <clears throat> look is utterly keeping with Sassetta's human and sensitive portrayal of the scene. A portrayal completely free of deadening dogma and exactly in tune with the buoyant spirit of Francis himself. Sassetta has found visual analogs not only for the spirit of the marriage of St. Francis to poverty, but for Fran Francescanism in general. The fertile plains with their rich patchwork fields, the forests, the tiny hills, softly bathed in the light of the sinking sun and the luminous sky which turns from white behind the hills to blue above. The soft unreal light in, in itself infuses every part of the picture with holiness, quietude, and peace. The strange juxtapositions of scale between figures and architecture or between figures and landscapes cannot be seen as mere mistakes on Sassetta's part. Rather, these rapid shifts in scale emphasize the reality of what is occurring. Like most everything else here, and like the great Francis in ecstasy, they transport us to an, uh, another purer world. This world is glimpsed again in this stigmatization of St. Francis. From the Sans Pulcro altarpiece, 
Here the craggy prism prismatic rocks, the small chapel and the tops of the trees are illuminated by the same divine light seen in the mystic marriage of St. Francis to poverty. Warm and flickering, it seems to come from a vision of the crucified Christ above. This holy light, which is Sassetta's metaphor for the spirit of Francis and his beliefs, is the same illumination we have seen in other panels from the same altarpiece. Comforting, comforting and panthetic is one of Sassetta's finest inventions. The solemn solemnity of the stigmatization, the crown of the saint's life, and the proof of his holiness is reinforced by Sassetta's judicial use of warm, sober earth colors. The predominant browns, grays, golds, and greens help form a crystalline land figures, architecture, and earth are set against a bright blue sky, lightly sleek streaked with wispy clouds throughout the picture one sees feels and almost breathes a subtle film of light and color the atmosphere of this picture and of other outdoor scenes on this sans sepul polero altarpiece seems to have deeply impressed the young piero del francesca a native of the sky, Sassetta's use of color, in its courting, and his fascination with tone and light must have been endlessly compelling to Piero, whose main interests lay along the same lines. Centuries later, it is hard for us to imagine what the now scattered altarpiece from San Sepulcro looked like when it was whole and fresh on the main altar of San Francesco. Yet from the dispersed damaged pieces, there still arises such powerful vision and imagination there, that there is no doubt that this work was a masterpiece. The ecstatic visions of passionate swaying figures engaged in actions of great purpose and dignity, all enveloped in wondrous light, must have moved the worshippers as they face the powerful altarpiece. Like so much of Sassetta's work, the San Polcro altarpiece is otherworldly yet full of earthly beauties, mystical yet approachable. Another fascinating aspect of Sassetta's painting is the strong imprint of his personality on the interpretation and the realization of image and story. That is something impossible to imitate, and in this sense, Sassetto's is unique in Sienese art. Nevertheless, several artists, his considerable talent, did paint within orbit of his remarkable style. Even though their works were not crafted with this cons consummate skill, they are exciting examples of the fantastic vision Sassetto's art inspired. The artist who developed, who perhaps understood Sassetto's aims best was responsible for a series of small panels of the life of St. Anthony. The eight scenes now scattered probably surrounded a large standing or seated image of the saint, most likely frontal and iconic. The scenes from his legend must have offered protection against St. Anthony's fire, dreaded, painful, and sometimes fatal bacterial disease named after him. Each of the eight panels chronicles a particular moment of the saint's life, a turning point, a miracle, or some other important event. His decision to leave the monastery and wander in the desert is the subject of one of the loveliest of the series. This painting is notable for the depiction of architecture, a smooth, unbroken green planes of the facade and flank of the church and the reddish orange tile roofs create an, an, an animated series of diagonals, verticals, and horizontals and form an exciting abstract grid. The sensitivity to subtle composition seen in the interweaving of the church, steps, roofs, 
doorways and looming campanile is something the artists certainly learned from Sassetta. Yet in all eight pictures, there is something unsettling. The spectacular feels a little off balance, as though the scene were slowly shifting that quality is not characteristic of Sassetta. Even in the most visionary moments, the basic method of pictorial construction, the creation of space, the placement of architecture and other objects, and the relation between the, those objects in the St. Anthony scenes differs from Sassetta's. Where's the picture here? I think I forgot the picture here. Let me go ahead and do a close up of that. There we go. This St. Anthony's leaving the monastery has a cool beauty of subdued but balanced color, harmonious interlocking composition, and intense figure, excuse me, figural gesture. The characteristics are present in other St. Anthony scenes, but are especially evident in the charming meeting of S.S. Anthony and panel, figure 36. Here, space recedes both into the picture and up its surface as the artist utilizes both the older convention of placing the things that are farthest back at the top of the picture and the net newer concept of making things recede towards the background. Again, the combination creates a curious but not unpleasing feeling of the shifting and imbalance, which in this case happily sets the sage for a miraculous story. St. Anthony's journey to meet the ancient hermit St. Paul is told graphically by both the multiple figures of the Voyager dressed in pink and black and the twisting path that runs from upper left to lower right. Like everything else in this picture, the path is a mixture of the real and the symbolic, the literal and the figurative. The native Sienese love of landscape all surfaces also in this picture Landscape is derived ultimately from Lorenzetti, but passed through Sassetta's world. Although it lacks his mysterious light, of course, it is not a portrait of a place, but the topography of fantasy, a setting in which centaurs prance and hermit saints embrace. In this painting and in all the others, from the St. Anthony series, the artist shows great sensitivity to color and originality in its use. He works in the tradition of a long line of Sienese colorists from Duccio to through Sassetta, but it is to the latter that he is most immediately indebted. The contrast between the green and brown of the, green, of the trees and the, the gray pink undiluting or undiluting earth are subtle lyrical and captivating the fields formed by the pinks blacks and creams of the saints robes in the foreground like the smooth green and white plains of the saint anthony leaving the monastery are exciting abstractions of both color and form Yet these pictures are much more than the sum of their compositional devices, for they have a strange, bewitching atmosphere. Perhaps the most en entrancing of the entire series of the St. Anthony and the Porringer. Originally near the center foreground stood a Porringer, possibly painted in silver. This object, now completely removed, was really a devil who had transformed himself to tempt the saint. But upon seeing the Porringer, Anthony raised his hand and the object disappeared in a puff of smoke. Set in a desolate wind-swept land of folded hills, and arid soil, the saint appears alone, isolated, the only living thing except for a few animals and birds. The thorny gnarled trees themselves seem as devoid of life uh, as the very stones. A shifting pattern of color, the green foreground, the pinkish gray plain on which the smooth pink church stands, and the distant gray, dark gray mountains la lapped by a green sea transforms the sea seen into a surpassing quilt arching 
above the earth and dominating it as a dazzling sky from the smoldering pink horizon. It grows progressively lighter and more luminescent until it is streaked by swift clouds of gray, blue, and purple, reflecting the rays of the rising sun from just these several inches of, of paint. One senses the vast curvature of the earth and the limitless sky. Full of movement and drama, the glowing sky is the ethereal counterpart of the barren. Devil-inhabited wilderness with its ominous black trees, its unyielding hills, and its lonely human occupant. The gaunt ascetic desert, saint wrestling with demonic forces, the attribution, attribution of the panels of the legend of Saint Anthony has been the subject of many much controversy. Various experts have given them to Soseto, to Sono, di Pietro and to an artist called the Master of the Orsavanza, Orsavanza. After his triptych of 1436 in the church of the Osservanza just outside Siena, this large work is close in style to, uh, to the St. Anthony panels. It ultimately derives from Sassetta for the delicate Madonna, the hefty child, and the two stern saints are variants on his style, the wide subdued range of clear color and the love of pattern and elegant line. Although characteristic of almost the entire Sienese school are also taken directly from Sassetta. Yet the master of Orsavanza Orsa triptych is recognizable personality. He is not refined or polished as Sassetta, nor does he have Sassetta's remarkable light and atmosphere that he is nevertheless a painter of considerable talent basically conservative and cautious he is less impressed than Sassetta, especially the young Sassetta by the new florentine style of the masaccio and Mussolino. his debt to the past is always evident and like Sassetta himself he owes much to simone martini that guiding light of many sienese artists one of the closest connections between the master of Orsavanza and the artist responsible for the Saint, for the Saint Anthony scenes occurs in the Saint Jerome, Jerome in the desert, figure 38. One of the predella panels of the Orsavanza triptych. It is now in the Siena Pinacoteca and has recently been cleaned. At first glance, it is very like the St. Anthony panels, the treatment of the landscape, the trees, and the figure of the kneeling saint are similar. But there is rationally about the construction of the landscape and the light of that is unlike the illogical world of the St. Anthony scenes. Full of delicate and varied color, the St. Jerome in the desert seems strongly influenced by the little paintings of the legend of St. Anthony. However, it lacks the fundamental mystery of those extraordinary panels. Its imagery is somehow tamer, more graspable. The love of clear limpid color in the St. Jerome in the desert in which large areas of unmodulated hue form a striking color fields punctuated by strong accents such as the bright pink of the saint's hat or the green trees with their yellow fruit reappears in what is perhaps the Orsavanza's master's finest work, The Birth of the Virgin. In Asinio, this remarkable altarpiece is based directly on the painting of, of the same subject by Pietro Lorenzetti in Siena. The fact that a work painted more than a century earlier could be such a strong source of inspiration for this talented and invent, inventive painter shows how alive the past was to Sienese Renaissance artists. Of course, the or Savanza master has made certain fundamental modifications for his approach to the story is different 
For instance, St. Anne's bed is has been shifted to the right and replaced by the attendant woman and a door through which one sees ne the next room. Also new are the large upper panels of the Virgin, Child, and Angels and the scenes of the Virgin's death and burial. Pattern, line, color, and gold combine to make the ascent Asiano birth of the Virgin, a brilliant altarpiece. Pietro Lorenzetti's somber treatment of the scene has been in li livid, livened by the introduction of scores of decorative details and pattern. The story has been made more particular and homey, like the painting of the same subject by Paola di Giovanni Fe in the Sienese Pinacoteca which also seems to have strongly influenced the Orsavanza master. Here's a good example of an artist of the late Trecento influencing an important artist of the next generation. There are also a number of interesting paradoxes in the Asiano painting. For instance, the flora on the, and the side walls recede toward the horizon in an orderly fashion, giving the impression of a convincing movement back into space. However, this feeling is partially negated by the con conscious introduction of many space denying patterns and by the tipping of the wall just outside the leftmost door, the tension between a rational mathematical construction of space and a more empirical, more impressionistic vision characterizes much of Sienese painting of the 15th century. A wonderful example of this conflict is in the Virgin bidding of the Apostles farewell. One of the Perdia panels from the Asiana birth of the Virgin, near the center of the picture of the walls of the Virgin's house move into space in an alarming rush. Like the fluttering Apostles who fly in at the left, the very house seems to float inside where the ancient virgin says goodbye to her. And then here's the painting. I'm trying to get it so you can get it all. Says goodbye to her faithful friends. The scene in spatially is spatially calmer. Although the floor tiles are set in a disturbing pattern which makes the floor seem to shift slightly, the master or Cervanza has purposely distorted the construction of one point perspective by making the floor pattern slightly irregular. The rush of space, the instability of the central structure and its foundation, and the strong asymmetric, asymmetric contrast between the void on the left and the architecturally divided and subdivided space on the right are all part of the artist's cons consciously constructed narrative. The combination of the real and the fantastic reinforces the miraculous nature of the tender and touching scene. Without a doubt, the master of the Orsavanza was a painter of considerable talent. Although his work stems from Sassetta and is also heavily indebted to the late Trescento, and to the great masters of the early Quattrocento, he forged his own style. It has been suggested that the master of the Orsavanza is none other than the Sano di Pietro, a well-known prolific artist active in Siena until the 1480s. There are two reasons for this suggestion. First, the stylistic and interpretive characteristics of the paintings by Orsavanzo Master and Sano are strikingly similar. Second, the earliest certain work by Sano di Piero, Pietro, a large polyptic and in the Siena Pinacoteca, dates only from 1444. Sano was born in 1406 and enrolled in the Painters Guild in 1428. Consequently, he was in the late 30s when he signed and dated his first known work. In Quattrocento, young artists usually started their careers in their early 20s. Sano's matriculation would square, square with that. 
Seldom, if ever, do an artist's works date from his late 30s. All this means that it is very likely that Sano had executed a considerable body of work before he painted his earliest known dated picture. But can that body of work be the paintings identified with Orso Savanzo Master? Or to put it in another way, was the young Sano responsible for the 1436 polyptic from which the Orsavanza master takes his name? This question is extremely difficult to answer because all Sano's work, certain works are dated 1444 or later and come from a mature period in the artist's life when his style was already fixed. When we turn to Sano's more certain work, we are on firmer ground. The style of his first undisputed painting, the 1440 for Pinacoteca Polyptic, is closely reflected in a fragmentary altarpiece of St. George slaying the dragon, figure 41. This boldly dramatic work betrays some of Sano's most important art, artistic debts. His love of abstract pa pa pattern, excuse me, is apparent in the shapes made by the highly stylized bodies of the rearing charger and the scaly twisting dragon. The large arabesques of the these two principles derive ultimately from Bartol Bartolo di Freddi or another of the influential early Quattrocento painters. The fantasy of work, the toy-like horse, and the rather tame dragon with tiny influ and effectual wings and puppet-like mouth is another characteristic of Sano's painting. One he shares not only with Bartolo di Freddi, but also with Sassetta. A fairy tale air permeates this painting, the bold knight on his fearless steed, the frightened pr princess praying for her salvation, the evil dragon, the fantastic trees heavy with fruit, and in the distance a walled town whose towers catch the sun are all part of Sano's particularly romantic fantasy. Action is frozen in a lovely, timeless, pristine world. All this is achieved, however, by a highly sophisticated manipulation of form and color. The touchstone for Sano's style is the large polyptych of 1444 in the Sienese Siena Pinacoteca, signed and dated by the artist, is the largest and finest of his surviving works. Exquisitely wrought and confident, it is certainly the painting of a mature artist, and it stands as proof that he had done much previous work. Emma's perfect perfectly preserved, it seems only to be missing the predella. Sano's painting shows what such polyptics originally looked like. It is composed of many compartments, arched, fretted, and pinnacled. It is large and in its size, complexity, and splendor. Both the frame and the painted surfaces are covered with considerable amounts of gold, a sure sign that this commission was expensive and prestigious. The central field of the polyptych is occupied by the Virgin, Child, and Saints. Saint Jerome appears at the Madonna's right hand. The position of greatest honor of on a polyptych Originally, the painting was in the Siena convent of the Gesueto di San Girolamo. I'm sorry. But the Virgin kneels before the Bieto Giovanni Colombini. The title Bieto, or Blessed, signifies that Giovanni was considered a sort of Damasaint, <clears throat> demi-saint, Although he was never canonized, there were numerous biete in the turbulent history of Sienese spirituality, and many like Giovanni Colombini withdrew from the world into a life of mystical contemplation and asceticism. But above the fervent, fervent Giovanni Col Colombini 
rises the Madonna clad in an almost perfect, almost perfectly preserved robe of light blue with elastic hands. She holds a stiff Christ child whose bright pink garment forms a striking contrast with her own blue clothes. Similar bright fields of color are seen in the reds, blues, and yellows worn by the angels who hold red and white roses behind the Virgin's throne. Sano is not subtle, a colorist as Sassetta. His palette is bright and clear, more like that of the of the St. Anthony scenes attributed to the Orsavanza master. Throughout his works, and especially in the 1444 polyptic, Sano delights in rendering in multiplicity of objects, the variegated marbles on which the saints stand, the embroidered cloaks and hymns, the flowers, the angel wings, and the books create a wealth of visual detail and color. An encrusted jewel-like quality is his hallmark. The sheer size and the variety of color, pattern, and detail of the 1444 polyptic are overwhelming. The altarpiece seems to glitter and glow not with coldness of a diamond, but with the warmth and depth of a lustrous ruby or emerald. Sano's altarpiece, figure 43, for the cathedral at Pianza, done about 15 years later, was probably commissioned by Ennio Silvio Piccolomini, the famous humanist Pope Pius II. The altarpiece is very modern. Its up-to-date frame has fluted pilasters, classically inspired capitals, and a pediment. That may have been Pius's idea rather than the choice of the rather conservative Sano. All the altarpieces in the cathedral have similar frames, which are very much in keeping with the style of the church. Designed by Florentine architect, Bernardo Rossellini, the Pope may have felt that the type of collaborate fussy frame around Sano's 1444 polyptic and similar works would have been out of place in the severe unadorned setting of the new church of Pienza. This attitude may also help to explain the, a composition that is unusually severe for Sano. The relative simplicity of the main field with its four saints placed in a V around the Virgin, the measured interval, and the studied calmness of gesture make for an extremely stable, quiet depiction of the Virgin, Child, and Saints. This mood and the comprehensible space that helps give rise to it may have resulted from the influence of several Florentine artists. Perhaps Sano, who was around 55 when the Pianza altarpiece was painted, looked at Fra Filippo, Lippi, Fra Angelica, or other several Florentines painting in about the same style, or it was is possible that he turned to his Sienese contemporary, Vicetia, who was working in a Florentine-influenced idiom. Sano might have been led to experiment with this style by his commission. Similar altarpieces in the cathedral suggest that it may have stipulated a picture consisting of a virgin and a child flanked by four saints. All in a single field, such a composition like the frame types of all the altarpieces might have been considered appropriate for the dignified new cathedral. Yet even in this, in this most sober of his paintings, Sano's style remains staunchly Sienese. The skillful and original use of color continues Mauve, subtle greens and browns, cool grays and warm reds abound. The contrasting colors of the robes isolate the figures and call attention to them as entities. Each large color chord cord moves the viewer's eye across the surface of the painting in a series of abrupt jumps. Moreover, the richness of the 1444 polyptic and most of Sano's other paintings is maintained in the Pienza altarpiece. The oriental rug on which the figures stand, the gold encrusted embroidered cloth over the throne, the heavy woolen garments and the roses held by the attending angels all give the variety and assumptionness that are characteristic of Sano. 
All his autograph paintings display a delight in, in a love of the stuff of the physical world. As his popularity grew, Sano became one of the busiest artists in Tuscany. The list of his surviving works is itself impressive, but with the increase in work came a corresponding increase in the intervention of Sano's helpers because there was much to do and so many patrons waiting. Sano turned over a considerable amount of the actual painting and sometimes even the designing to members of his workshop. During the last decades of his career, consequently, the quality of both conception and execution declined. Some works seem to be connected with the artists only by virtue of being produced in his shop, while others, especially the scores of small panels of the Madonna and Ch Christ, child with saints and angels, appear to have been almost mass-produced. Nevertheless, several later works still demonstrate the facility of Sano's sparkling art, notably the large altarpiece, figure 44, in the Caligata of the small town of San Chiarso de Orcio in the Sienese territory, also surrounded by an upper up-to-date frame complete with pilasters and a carved lunette. This depiction of the Madonna and Child with angels and saints includes S.S. Quiricho and Fortunato, both of whom were objects of local devotion. Although the main field of the painting is still made up of three panel panels, each with its own arch top, Sano has spatially unified the picture by a continuous pattern floor. However, he carefully avoids a completely coherent space by not allowing the orthogonals of the pattern to recede into space toward a single vanishing point on the horizon. He thus achieves a more irregular, less logical support for the figures. The Virgin and Saints are placed between the predella and a large painted lunette. The pretty and charming predella still contains many echoes of Sano's art, but the major interest of the altarpiece lies in the resurrection and Christ in lim limbo scenes in the lunette. Sano again recalling Sassetta and perhaps the small St. Anthony scenes has created a spectral resurrection. Just as the sun's first rays start <coughs> turning the clouds, the softest shade of pink, a weightless Christ glides out of this sarcophagus placed before the still black hills, ethereal and shining in his less, I'm sorry, in his white and pink robes. He hovers silently over the earthbound soldiers dressed in strong colors of red, gray, yellow, and purple. The bright foreground forms a striking contrast with black, the black hills and silhouetted cypresses. The Christ in limbo is equally impressive. The same radiant Christ enveloped in a luminous mandolora reaches out to touch the kneeling supplicants. The natural, the supernatural illumination energizes this, these lunette scenes and makes them eerie. With their large size at the brightness of their carefully corded color and their remarkable illumination, these narratives make an impressive crown for the altarpiece. As the altarpiece demonstrates, Sano was capable, even late in his career, of producing works of considerable interest conservative and traditionalist in the best CNE sense. He has often been accused of being a retarder, the, the terror artist, but this charge is untrue and anachronistic. These, the CNEs of the 15th century did not think in terms of avant-garde, or old-fashioned, each artist was part of the powerful and respected tradition of Sienese art, which traced its foundations to Duccio and the early Trecento. The very fact that Sano received so many commissions from such diverse pa pat patrons, both in Siena and outside the city's walls, 
testifies to his popularity with those who paid for art. Such commissions would not have been awarded to someone who was out of step with this time. Moreover, as the autograph works themselves show, Sano was endowed with considerable talent for a specific type of religious imagery. He also showed a marked but, again, limited development of the idiom of Sasada to a more personal style not untouched by some of the contemporary developments in Florence. Above all, Sano is one of the happiest, most untroubled artists to have painted in Siena in the Quattrocento. While his work occasionally shows an interest in the mystical and supernatural, his major concern is the depiction of comely figures swathed in robes of bright color in an opulent world. Objects, flowers, marble, floor tiles, embroidered robes, angels, wings, and a hundred other tangible things fascinate him. Deep pity is usually not reflected in his figures or landscape, with the exception of the St. Anthony pictures, if indeed they are Sano's, Sano's and the San Quirtra Lunette, but in the innate word wonder of glistening gold threads on a rich cloak or in a soft rose petal of almost incandescent white. It is with our heart than with our mind that we love Sano. Giovanni Di Paolo, a contemporary of Sano's, is an artist of entirely different character. Both cerebral and emotional, he ranks with Sassetto among artists of the first half of the century in Siena, Giovanni's earliest surviving painting, and without d doubt, one of his first is the now fragmentary Pecci altarpiece executed in 1426. I'm sorry, for the Church of San Domenico in Siena. His talents were recognized early for the this expensive and prestigious commission was awarded to Giovanni when he was only about 25. Fortunately, the center panel, figure 20, 46, of the Pecci altar piece has survived. And a recent cleaning of the... Cleaning reveals the brilliance of Giovanni Di Paolo's youthful style. When first impresses one about this picture is the careful and sumptuous work, working of the surfaces, the Madonna em em embroidered dress, the angel's wings of peacock feathers, and the fantastic rug, rug covered with plant motifs, and the wonderful punched halos with their elaborate inscriptions all make for a precious picture, like a detailed cameo or an elaborately set jewel like Gentile di Fabriano's Uffizi, Adoration of the Magi of three years earlier, the Pecci Madonna was meant to glorify the holy figures and to proclaim the wealth and good taste of the individual who paid for it. The Madonna and the angels display a remarkable de delicacy of execution and a sweetness of the of expression. The branches and flowers entwined in the angels' radiant blonde hair are worked with a skill seldom seen in Quattrocento painting. The attenuated tense figures and the hands of the music-making angels are also exquisite. Much of this delicacy and refinement owns owes its orig origin to Paolo di Giovanni Fay, whose sophisticated and refulgent pa panels were admired by Giovanni de Paolo. The latter may have made a trip to Florence shortly before beginning the Pecci altarpiece. For the massive broad-shouldered child who sits in a complex position appears to be indebted to some lost composition by Masaccio, or one of his early followers. It is interesting that although Giovanni di Pia Paolo was clearly impressed by the volume of and spatial dominance of Masaccio's art, he chose to utilize the qualities only in the child. Such selective use of the Florentine idiom is one of the hallmarks of his extremely personal art. The individuality of Giovanni's thoughts on religious narrative is evident. 
in the Dia panels of the Pecci Altarpiece, which are now divided between, I don't know why it does that. It just stops, guys. That's the end of the chapter. It's not even all of it. So that's the end of uh, this chapter. It just stops. Thank you.